So. so, Rabbi Asher, this is one more thing that, you know, because as you said that different rabbis interpret in a different way, that will definitely confuse the goyim, like, you know, with whom to go, <laughs> whom not to go, like, that will be more difficult for them to, don't you have but some... But don't follow rabbis, that's the thing. <laughs> like, what is Judaism? I mean, Judaism is only the five books of Moses and halakha. That's all. If you master the five books of Moses and you master halakha, you've mastered essentially what's required of you. Everything else is like the frosting on the cake, whether it's Kabbalah, whether it's Musa, Hasidus, it's just frosting on the cake. Hey, Rabbi, can I, yeah. can I ask you a question? Yeah. So I have like a, uh, a chart of all the uh, Judean and I guess... Uh, Israeli uh, kings and prophets. So, like throughout the historical narrative, have you and you have a you know an understanding of all the books? Like, what is the uh, psychological? Is there a is there some type of like uh, transformation or adjustment or changes that uh, took place uh, dependent on kings or prophets or how how does the religion or philosophy or psychology of Judaism changed from you know beginning to now? Um. I mean. Maybe just three three big standouts to you from your understanding or reading. So we don't have a grasp of how Judaism was lived or thought of in the times of Jewish kings or of the prophets. We just don't know. In terms of the Mishnah and the Brises, all these things are in and around the time of the destruction of the Second Temple. Who knows what was actually practiced before? Now, I'm going to use language that Christians understand. I believe in faith that the rabbis who appear in the Mishnah come from a line of, of rabbis who have smicha or like ordination going all the way back to Moses. I mean, I believe in the Rambam writes in his introduction to Mishnah Torah that even the prophets had their own court and this law was passed by court to court all the way down. This is what we believe in faith. So once I heard a Satmer, the Hasid once teach how like Moshe Rabbeinu wore a pancake hat. And I mean, there's people who believe this. I mean, they think that Judaism was practiced back then like it was practiced today. I don't believe it at all. I believe that as long as you limit it to the Chumash and the instructions from the Sanhedrin, everything else is just secondary and it doesn't really matter. That's what's sanctioned in the Torah for us to do. And this is a rabbinic perspective. It's not a Karite perspective. You know, so you will be like, well, if you don't believe in this and that, you're a Karite. It's not true. I don't think anyone has the answer of, of how Judaism was practiced. I mean, we see with the mosaics how they would use Greek and Roman mythology in the tombs of the rabbis, things that no one would think of it being done post the Rambam. And then people nowadays understand Judaism from a Rambamist perspective. He was so influential that he changed Judaism completely, philosophically, of, of what God is and what God is and how one could refer to God. And people teach it like it was given to Moses like this. It's changed so much. That's why I don't walk around condemning people. I mean, as long as they believe in the Torah and instructions from the court, I mean, that's good enough to please God, in my opinion. So if nobody is asking anything, so let me ask you one more thing. So I know that, um, you know, the concept of Messiah coming is, you said that it may not happen like what the Christianity believes. But still then, if the king comes, don't the Jews that they expected uh, uh, Jesus when he was alive, you know, the story is true, when he was alive there, they're expecting him to be Messiah, then they were asking all these questions. And he was not fulfilling anything. That's why they didn't accept Jesus as Messiah. So coming king, when he comes, uh, you think that, uh, you know, there won't be any wars, there will be peace, and he will set the tone of that. You know, all these things would happen at the time. I'm going to respond from a Rambam perspective, just because if I just start telling you what I believe, I mean, I'm going to sound like a heretic. According to the Rambam, if we see that the temple's built, and the Jews are coming back to their rightful place. And if this individual, this potential Messiah, partakes in all these things, causes or helps these things to occur, then it says that he's Mashiach Vadai. Like he's, then we know he's the Messiah. Not that he's gonna institute all these things. These things are just gonna happen. It almost overrides our free will for God to just send someone who's gonna force us to do things. It's gonna have to come from us as a people, getting our act together, physically building the temple again, and then we could properly elect the king because kings are also elected. It's not that they just declare themselves to be king, which is really what Jesus did. He said his kingdom was not of this earth. He wasn't 
playing with the same rules that Jews were playing with in terms of awaiting a king, a godly king like David. This is why I assume the first, the earlier Jews didn't accept him. I don't think the whole son of God thing would have been an issue, really. Judaism was pretty Gnostic back then. Even Chabad has the whole notion of an atzmut and a goof, divine essence and bodily form. I don't think these things ever really bothered Jews outside of the Rambam. It's just seeing is believing, bringing sovereignty back to Israel, like not instituting world peace in, in some non-pragmatic manner. Physically, I mean, when King Solomon made Israel one of the greatest powers in the world, was it metaphysically or was it because of his decision, because he was wise because of this? But now we expect the Messiah to be like a magician, a sorcerer, to make these things Rabbi. Up. I have two uh, follow-up questions for you. Do you, A, take it literally, you know, rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem and a Messiah or what you might call like a a Superman? King. No, I don't. I don't believe in the Superman Messiah that people wait for is now. It a, believe in is a it king. A, okay, so then I guess then the second question is, how do you also, um, um, do you recognize the association, I guess, with uh, the mind, the temple or the house and the mind? I mean, that type of Kabbalistic uh, education and understanding with regards to, uh, I guess, you know. I don't know. And I view Kabbalah essentially disposable. If, if it brings you closer to God, then great. But in terms of it adding anything to our theology that's tangible, not at all. There is no temple in the Chumash. There's a Mishkan. Fine. A temple is a Mishkan with a stone base. We're expected to build a sanctuary for God. And that's it. It's not in heaven. It's not spiritual. It's not... No, I mean, like, in our personal lives, in our minds, peace in our minds, like, peace in our lives. I mean, isn't that essentially building, you know, a temple yeah. for... If someone wants peace and wants to think clearer, start listening to Jordan Peterson. Don't try to take practical biblical concepts and give them a mystical twist because at the end you won't be able to distinguish between the mysticism and what literally appears in the bible and that's what happens nowadays i mean people quote rashi like Wait, say that again what, what was that uh what was that one line about jordan peterson <laughs> that if people are looking for inner peace but right? rabbi what about like the mishkan and the mashkan I mean, yeah, yeah. So what was that? go, go ahead like... no if you want inner peace in terms of trying to think clearly instead of trying to give every practical concept that appears in the Chumash a mystical twist, there's enough people that could help you think clearer and put your house in order than trying to mystify concepts that were meant to remain practical. In terms of now, according to Rashi, we're waiting for the Beit HaMittach, I mean, to fall down from heaven. Instead of saying, wait, why are we waiting for a last temple? I mean, there's, there's you're no... Saying, you're, last saying Torah, you're saying Torah is, is you know, it's holy and we God gave it a sign and we learned that for you know, for, for, for the mitzvah, for Kedush, but it's not really that relevant, you would say, as much as, you know, for relevancy, you would go to Jordan Peterson. Uh, no, it's relevant. Like, oh, I was answering that? his question that he's saying, like, how about the mystical notion of a mm. temple? That, like, a temple in your mind, the temple in your soul. I'm against people doing that because they fail to make a distinction, but they just need someone to write that down, and before you know it, like, people are learning in yeshiva and not making a distinction between what the Torah actually says about an actual physical temple versus your body being a temple, which is what, like, Yeshka taught or something. I think people and, would be running to build a temple like if they weren't waiting for it to fall from heaven. You know okay, what I mean? Okay, wait, there's different temples. There's physical temples. You heard that you, you're familiar with uh, Shay Tau as a beautiful clip. Yeah, he Shay Tau just mentioned Jordan Peterson as an Jordan example. Peterson, whatever. Yeah, I think what Rabbi Usher is saying is not Jordan Peterson. He's saying philosophy per se, because that's what right. Rambam Usher, wants. Are you, are you wants people to have time. <laughs> Jordan Peterson to me is not Do I sound good. like from Bar Park? No, no, but I don't know. I'm from yeah, Miami. You remind me, so I think... So we'll pause for a second about Jesus and... Uh, First of all, being a spiritual king, or because he wasn't literally a guy that was taking over, he maybe kicked a few tables, but we didn't see him to be like Bar Kokhba or anything like that. Um, he had no military might. Um, I mean, the, the the church later maybe, but not the actual person who was just a street preacher and had a unfortunate, very quick end. But then there is um, where in Judaism do we have the concept? So, if you believe that there's some truth to the fact that Judaism starts after Yechezkel, which is the first prophet born outside the land from Baghdad. And his message was that, because um, the Jews were actually, you know, wondering if they could... Yechezkel wasn't born in Baghdad, he was born in Israel. He served in the temple, but he was prophesying. Right, he was, a pri he was a priest, but you're saying he was born in Israel, and then, s so some people think he was the first to be born outside the land. Okay, I have to look that up. Yeah, it's important. I thought he was from Baghdad. 
in any case, what Yechezkel says, after they lose the temple and they realize that they're not the kingdom of Yahweh that's going to reign supreme on earth is not the kingdom they're going to get. So he says that no longer is it really, God doesn't care about your military might um, and you know your land and your politics. God cares about your purity of the heart. So this is, I, I, I believe this is coming out of Yechezkel. Now, if Jesus said the same thing at the same time, it happens. It's very likely that it could happen at the time when people were, you know, I guess the temple was becoming less popular because it was a cash business and there was a lot of people in power and the people outside were not, and it was becoming the 1%. I don't know. But um, the Judaism that you have today, which for some, in, in some ways is actually stopping people from going back to their ancient times where there was a temple and you made the gods happy with animal sacrifices, just like it says in the Torah. But uh, the Judaism they have today is more like that. It's more about being spiritual, being pure. And then you throw in some ethics to make it nice and have a good vartira. And you throw in some morality, some social, you know, welfare, which was what synagogues were. Even before they prayed in synagogues, they were welfare centers and learning Torah, which is pretty much what uh, soul occupation. People don't do big prayer groups. They do Torah groups, right? You pray, but there's no big deal about prayer. They don't get crazy about it. Um, and, uh, so that's what you have, um, left of a religion. And it's been going like that for 2000 years. And even now that we have all the money, I mean, I don't know about money, but we have the organization that we can get together and rebuild a temple and even make one, you know, it's not going to be the mythical one because then it can become all these questions of heresy because they know we're not, we're not making the third one. We're just, we're just fixing the second one. Second one was damaged by a pogrom, by a fire, by a riot, by a war, by some fanatics that that were involved in this war. And we're just building it. This is not a political statement. This is just because we want to have that spiritual place where we burn animals and do it, you know, pretty basic. So it looks like Judaism kind of replaced that. Maybe they were fed up with it. I don't know. But it looks like Judaism took a big turn. So um, whatever Jesus said and whatever came out of the uh, the interpreters of Jesus, whether they were Jewish or Christian, um, even even going into Islam, you can, you know. Yehuda, you said you want to barbecue animals? Like, I mean, would you actually want to partake in that or help organize that? I probably like, would visit, but I'm not a religious. Is it a, is it, is it a barbecue? And I mean, is the food used for consumption? Like, 